Welcome everyone to the World Health Network. We are excited tonight. We have mask nerd Aaron Collins here with co-founder of the World Health Network, Yinir Baryam, and entrepreneur Geraldine Hamilton to lead a conversation. Tonight we'll be discussing why now more than ever it's so important that we understand masks given the new COVID variants, um, dealing with monkeypox coming through, um, general air quality and health. We'll be learning about mask fit styles, best masks for different activities such as exercise. And then we'll open it up um, toward the second half of the talk uh, for questions at the end. So let's get started. Hi, Erin, so glad you can join us. You wanted to start off and tell us what inspired you to focus your attention on masks? I know that you went from mechanical engineer and now you have this very successful YouTube account. Um, Tell us a little bit about that transition. Sure. I mean, it, it, it really was happenstance. Um, so, you know, I have a, I'm a mechanical engineer with a background in aerosol science. And so my formidable years of education, undergraduate and master's, was uh, at, a, at, a, at the University of Minnesota. Uh, working at the, at, at the University of Minnesota, there's a large aerosol uh, community, um, the Particle Technology Lab, as well as at, where I was doing my master's work, the Center for Diesel Research, where we're looking at diesel engine emissions. Um, so I did my undergraduate master's there. And during the master's, I, I, in one of the basic aerosol classes, I remember, you know, it's 2013, so it's kind of right after SARS, um, very first SARS-CoV-1, the, the discussion was kind of that, could it be that some of these diseases are airborne spread, right? And, uh, and how might we tackle that in a pandemic? And kind of the, the answer was, well, you, everyone will wear N95s. And my first thought was, well, I'll probably never need that information because what's the probability that a pandemic happens in my lifetime? Uh, and so I, I moved on from that. I didn't think much about it. Uh, and then I, I continued on my aerosol world, uh, in the aerosol world, working at a small, uh, well, actually probably like what, at the time, probably the second largest uh, aerosol science company in the U.S., um, an instrumentation company, worked there for about eight years. And then uh, I decided to uh, broaden my horizons uh, using my, te my techniques to work in a micro scale. But uh, 2020 rolls around and pandemic hits. I kind of remember that discussion um, about, you know, what would happen if I had a pandemic and SARS-CoV-1 per perhaps being airborne spread and we'd all wear N95s. And so um, I was a little disconcerted at the beginning, but then we see the aerosol scientists coming around around June of this year to, to discuss, you know, airborne spread and the, the famous, you know, petition that they had written to the World Health Organization, as well as a journal article by, you know, Lydia Marawaska and Don Milton and, and Lindsay Marr. And so, you know, to me, it was like, oh, that the next step is, is better mass, right? Because we've been talking about cloth masks, which, yeah, you know, they kind of work, but, you know, they're not really that effective. Um, and, uh, and so comes, you know, come around July, I kind of realized that, you know, it's been six months. We, we still can't get N95s in the U.S. I think that, you know, the evidence is conclusive. It's airborne spread as a mechanism that could be happening. I wanted to protect myself, my family. And it turns out I'm kind of an aerosol nerd, too. I had everything in my basement to test masks. So I, uh, I decided to... Uh, to kind of start to evaluate the performance of international respirators, KN95s and KF94s. Tested them, found them performing really well. Some of them, these Korean KF94s work really, really well. And I decided that I would, uh, I'd go to tackle how to, how to measure that at like your, at your lab, in a lab setting. Uh, and I happen to have everything that you need in my basement. I'm kind of a weirdo. I like to buy things on eBay. Instruments that would sell for $50,000, you can get on eBay for $500 if you know what you're looking for and you don't mind it being a little old. So I had everything in my basement to uh, to test to test masks, uh, and I was sit and, and at the time actually I didn't think of it. I have to give my wife credit. I was sitting at the dining room table, going like, "Are these masks real? How could I tell? What could I do?" And my wife kind of just looked at me and was like, "Why don't you just test them? Isn't that what you do?" And I'm like, "I mean, I guess I could, but I'm not. I mean, would I be the person to do that?" So I said, "Okay." So I set it all up in my bathroom. I I tested them initially off camera and was doing some lab setup, but they worked great decided I, I needed to tell my friends and what a better way to tell, you know, fellow uh, engineers about how you did something like shooting a video, right? Much more descriptive than writing it out in a long format email. Plus you can see the data real time. So I made this video. I put it on my YouTube channel. If you go to my YouTube channel prior to this, it is me racing motorcycles and bicycles and doing dangerous activities. And then the, suddenly there's this video of me saying, hey, here's me testing this mask. And I made it public so that I could share it to my friends. Um, and then people started commenting on it. And their questions. And so then I would say, okay, I try to answer all those questions on this YouTube comments. And it was like, man, this is a lot of work. I'll make another video and I'll answer all those questions in the next video and I'll test some more masks. 
And that's how it started. And I kept doing that. And I still am doing that today. I mean, I have, I've taken a little break from it for the last few months. But, and that's, that's kind of the, the impetus of how I got into mass testing and respirators, is really by happenstance and being one of the few people out there that kind of had all the things to do it. And I didn't have the, the sort of red tape that goes with academic positions or laboratories where they can't really test stuff and talk about where they bought it from because conflict of interest. Also, there's some issues like what if they present the data and the mass don't perform that well across all, you know, there's a lot of stuff that stopped them. Whereas me as an individual in my lab, in my bathroom, AKA my laboratory, I didn't have that limitation. Um, and so that's kind of, that, that is the story of how the, the birth of the mass nerd. That's great. Thanks, Aaron. Yeah. So we're going to move on to why is it so important now to pay attention about mass fit? Um, maybe, Yanir, you could tell us a little bit about the current situation and why it's so important that we have high quality, well fitted masks. Well, I, I think that uh, it should be, I hope, clear to many in this audience that um, the situation currently is many people are getting sick. Um, unfortunately, the reporting on cases, the testing and reporting on cases is not um, consistent with the clear uh, number of cases that are happening because many people know many people are sick, which is a good indication that the rate of infection is very high. Um, and um, uh, the reason, uh, un of course, has to do with the uh, new variants. Uh, now we are into the BA4, BA5. There are a couple of even newer variants, BE2, B, uh, there are BE and BF. I, I have to look up exactly the numbers because they're uh, just newly named from longer names um, that are sub-variants of, uh, of the B variety, which is Omicron, various variants, sub-variants. Um, but the main problem is that these variants are vaccine evading, previous uh, immunity evading, and they're growing rapidly uh, and they're affecting a lot of people. And in fact, the indication surely from BA4 and 5 is that there are more severe uh, hospitalizations have been uh, growing rapidly and deaths in countries where the cases are kind of leading um, in infection, including Portugal uh, and, and other places. So, so we see that the situation is actually quite uh, alarming, uh, but the um, authorities in many countries, governments and others uh, are not sounding the alarm. They're not doing a lot. They've um, decided that uh, what they've been able to do has been done. Uh, and unfortunately, that gives us the responsibility uh, as individuals to take care of ourselves, first of all, but also, of course, family members uh, and friends to the extent that we can reach people to understand that this risk is something that we shouldn't be taking. And, and of course, the risk is not just for the um, initial acute phase, including hospitalization and, and, and deaths, but also the long COVID, which is... Um, more and more um, uh, uh, alarming in terms of uh, what we know about it in terms of both um, uh, general uh, challenges, symptoms, but also specific organ damage in the brain, in the heart, in the lungs, uh, kidneys, and, and other uh, organs. So, so we have this tremendous challenge. Um, one of the things that we can do for ourselves as individuals is to wear masks. Now, it's important to realize that mask wearing should be done um, as a community because uh, there is a tremendously uh, strong effect of having two people or however many people are in the same space wearing masks. The risk reduction is, is highly nonlinear. It's multiplicative. Uh, and, um, and so... Uh, the best thing, of course, would be for everyone to be wearing masks to protect each other uh, under the current circumstances where some people or many people are not wearing masks. It leaves the burden on us as individuals to provide our own protection. And in that case, of course, especially making sure that we have highly effective uh, masks is critical. And so on that note, I think that 
um, understanding uh, why uh, Aaron's work uh, as the mask nerd is so important, uh, I will turn it back uh, to uh, him uh, to explain how we can understand um, uh, masks in a way that will enable us uh, to be better protected. Yes, Aaron, and if this is Geraldine, if you can just expand upon what Yanir just said and share with us what type of mask we should all be wearing. Is it okay to just continue to wear whatever it was in the beginning of the pandemic, or should we really be considering very specific masks such as N95 or so forth? So I think mass selection is very critical at this point. Um, and I think you know, there's a very good point that, you know, the concept of universal masking is a much more powerful mechanism to reduce the spread. Although that burden is then borne by everyone for an indefinite period of time. So I can, I understand people's getting annoyed with it. I <laughs> trust me, I understand it. Um, uh, so uh, I, I don't necessarily agree with our transition to one way masking in all con in situations. But when we talk about, you know, sort of the that, that only people are looking for protection when they're wearing a mask. There's, there is a specific style of mask, and that's called a respirator. And those we typically call like N95s or P100s. And there's international standards like FFP2 in Europe, uh, the KN95 um, in China, the KF94, which is their general population mask standard in South Korea. So, and uh, I think the last one's like the P2, which uh, comes out of uh, Australia and New Zealand. Uh, and pop possibly a few other countries. I'm not an expert in every country. Uh, but those masks uh, feature some important, really technological features that other masks like cloth masks don't, don't have. So cloth, although can capture particles and certainly works as a filter, it's not a very effective filter. And the technology within an N95 and all these other respirator designs uses this, um, a technology called electrically charged melt blown polypropylene. And what this is is an engineered material. It's got about 40 years of development behind it. Um, and what it is is really tightly spun fibers. They're maybe about you know one to five micron in diameter. They have this electrostatic charge applied to them, and they can capture particles. You know, so I kind of hear a lot of conversation about you know that that um, that they don't capture particles smaller than a virus, which isn't true. They can capture you know down to the single digit nanometers. Actually, um, it's just that there's this very narrow range where they they don't perform as well. And typically that's how we rate masks and filters at 0.3 to 0.1 micron. So that's why you see a lot of test aerosols in that size. Um, but those masks capture at really high rates. And for my testing and I've seen a lot of other test data, we, you know, in 95s, most people think a filter at 95% filtration efficiency, but actually they're actually much higher than that at moderate breathing rates. And for a typical COVID respiratory aerosol, you know, typical you know, even a, like a 3M, you know, 9205, the Aura series or any of those type of masks, filter at, you know, 99% filtration efficiency at the media. And so those types of masks can provide amazing protection, but there is one limitation, which is that we have to make sure the air goes through the mask and not around the mask. And so this is why like surgical masks, which do actually have that technology, they feature that melt blown material inside of it but the surgical mask is not designed to seal tightly to your face. The surgical mask is meant to protect uh, others from droplets coming out of your mouth and doesn't really provide a significant amount of protection to the wearer. In my testing, I got anywhere from you know, 40 to 80%, but if I wore a well-fitting N95 in my test, I could easily achieve 99% inhalation protection for this kind of laboratory, you know, bathroom type measurement. Um, so that, that, that highlights the power of them. And so what we wanna look for is respirators. They seal tightly to the face. They provide inhalation protection, meaning that if someone is not wearing a mask, you can still derive protection to yourself as an individual. And if used in a community setting where everyone wears them, they're extremely powerful because you get nearly that same level of protection to others and you get that protection. So if we were both wearing N95s, I mean, the protection level uh, in terms of you know risk of getting COVID if someone was infected is, is you know, orders of magnitude reduced in, that, in those types of scenarios. So that's why they can be so powerful and why we should be talking about respirators now. That's great, thank you, Aaron. Um, do we have some recommendations on resources uh, where we can find these um, masks that are well vetted or locations to purchase them? There are a ton of great options out there. So um, when we talk about in the US, uh, the N95 is a NIOSH regulated product. So to, to sell it at 95 in the U.S., it needs to be certified by NIOSH. Um, and those can be purchased actually 
in many places around you. So Home Depot has a great selection of N95s and P100s. And the difference between an N95 and a P100 is a P100 is designed for oily aerosols and is technically rated at 99.97. I typically don't recommend them for long-term wear because they are a little harder to breathe in. But you can go to Home Depot and pick out an N95. Um, there are also, so you know, home, any home stores or, or those um, like a Home Depot, Menards, Lowe's would carry them. You can also purchase them online. 3M now, if you if you find a particular 3M mask, you can go directly to their Amazon webpage uh, source. It'll be sold by and shipped by Amazon, so you can order them online. Project N95 is one of my favorite too. They are a nonprofit that is advocating for better respiratory protection for healthcare workers and, and the general public. And they uh, have a great website where you can buy a huge offering of N95s from, I, I would say almost everyone, even including 3M now, uh, a huge range of offerings. And that's a great place to go to. Uh, because one of the big challenges with N95s is you got to make sure they fit you. So it's best to buy in small quantities, try them, make sure they fit comfortable in your face. You don't feel any leaks. Um, and so that's kind of how I recommend to start. And so you can get them in store or online. Um, all of those are great options. Internationally, basically the same kind of recommendations, but I'm not sure of exactly uh, in terms of the local stores where you can get an FFP2 in, let's say, Germany. But that's kind of the limitation of my knowledge is restricted to the U.S. Yeah, I myself have looked on Amazon, but I've gotten pretty confused and suspicious about perhaps some of them not being well measured or regulated. So is it generally better to avoid Amazon with regards to purchasing and go, go to a direct website? That's usually my recommendation. I mean, if you're technically savvy and you know that it ships by sold by Amazon, you can you can definitely get legitimate respirators from there. Uh, if you're not careful, yeah, the, the Amazon marketplace is a little, <laughs> it's a bit like a flea market sometimes. Uh, so yes, direct websites are always a great option, especially if they direct you to an Amazon store. Um, one of the challenges that we haven't talked about yet is the most ubiquitous international respirator, the KN95. Um, and that is a, widely available on Amazon, but KN95s, a uh, couple things we should talk about. One, they historically have had a bad rep. For a good reason, a large fraction of them were fake. They had under, well, let's say underperforming. That means that they didn't meet the standard in which they claim they applied to. And so we saw that a lot uh, in the early in the pandemic. They have improved since then. But the KN95 is typically an ear loop mask. And one of the distinctions between an N95 and our international respirators like KN95s and KF94s is the attachment of the mask or respirator to your face. Some use ear loops and some use headbands. And on average, a headband is going to provide a tighter seal to your face. So if you're after really high levels of inhalation protection, then a headband is going to offer slightly on average better improvement. But it is no guarantee. So if I wear a extra, extra, extra large mask, <laughs> even if it's headband and it doesn't all seals to my face, it won't protect me as well as one that's well fitting. But on average, we see an improvement. Ear, lo ear loops, because they can't have as much tension. If you got the tension really high, it would just flop your ears forward and pop off. Um, and so they're kind of limited by the sort of physiology of your ears. And so they don't provide as much face sealing pressure. They're still way more effective than a well-fitting KF94 or KN95. It's still way better than a cloth mask and considerably better than a surgical mask. Um, but in the kind of, in the spectrum of what I like to say, you know, it's kind of a cloth mask is, I, I wouldn't even recommend them at all. Or surgical mask is on the very low end. And then it's kind of KN95s and KF94 ear loop style. If you want better protection in 95. And then beyond that, you can start talking about elastomeric respirators and PAPRs too, which are also, you know, it's kind of the hierarchy of what we look at in terms of respiratory protection and just to share kind of where i do my mask shopping uh, katie i go to and i think it's already been mentioned project 95 is a great organization and perhaps you near you could tell for those people who have not come across project 95 you could tell our audience a little bit about them please well they're a nonprofit, and they've really been working very hard to make available masks and they are evaluating them um, before they sell them, uh, as uh, as Aaron said, uh, Amazon is not doing their own testing of their masks, and so sometimes uh, they don't end up with the, the right masks. Um, whereas uh, uh, N95, Project N95, are, are are clearly very careful about what masks they offer, and so uh, one can be much more confident in ordering from them. Thank you. Uh, so, Aaron, if we could talk a little bit about fit testing, um, this is so important now 
um, especially now that most people are not wearing masks and we have to depend on our, our own mask fit to be as secure as possible. Um, can you explain what fit testing is and how folks might go about that? Yeah, and I think it's probably the most important thing when we talk about respirators. Um, in workplace settings, uh, so whether you're a construction worker, whether you're working in a lab, or you're a healthcare setting, OSHA, the Occupational Safe and Healthy Administration, requires that if you're using an N95 in a workplace, you have a fit test. And that's how important it is, because it's the only way to ensure that the mask you're wearing fits your face. And so focusing on making sure the air goes through that filtered mask and not around it is really what we're driving to to get the protection. And so, you know, in, in terms of, you know, in general public use, it gets a little harder because access to that specialty equipment isn't readily available, right? You can't just go to your, you know, your local grocery store and grab your N95 fit test kit. <laughs> it doesn't exist yet at that level, um, but you can get some access to them. And so there's kind of two mechanisms. And really what the, what the oh, sorry, excuse me, what the fit test is all about is a, a, quanti a metric to measure how well the mask is sealing to your face. Um, and so... There are a couple different like standardized industry ways to do it. One is called the qualitative metric. And this is a mechanism where we generate uh, a, an aerosol that would be using both either like a, a substance that you can taste on your tongue. Uh, masks don't filter smells. Respirators don't filter smells, not N95s at least. And so if you use gaseous materials, you can still smell it, right? So if, someone's, uh, if someone hasn't showered in a week and a half and you're hanging out with them in 95 you still might smell them, uh, but at least the particles won't be getting the mask. So we use uh, materials that you can taste on your tongue. Bitrex and uh, saccharin are two of them. So Bitrex is gonna taste really bitter and saccharin will be extremely sweet. And what you do is you kind of first test your method to make sure you can understand what that, that signal is. You don the mask, you put on a, basically a big plastic bag over your head, you spray that all around your face and you breathe in and you see if that taste it develops on your tongue. And if you do taste it, that's indicating that material, that aerosol is leaking around the mask and it's going over your tongue, collecting, and you taste it. And if you don't taste anything, that's a sign that the mask is sealing well to your face. And so those can be purchased. A project in 95 sells them. You're starting to see them kind of become more available. Uh, you know, from a community setting, you can partner with neighbors or other people to kind of split the cost. Around $200, although I do see the prices coming down. And if you're kind of a little do-it-yourself or if you kind of search around on Twitter, there are some great examples of people creating do-it-yourself fit testers using uh, medical ne like handheld medical nebulizers. And those medical nebulizers can do the same thing and they just kind of spray it around the mask. You know, you're not going to quite necessarily get as quality of a metric, but at least it's a good starting place to be able to identify a mask. Um, and then there's another method and that's called the quantitative fit testing. And that uses a specialty instrument. It's actually the same thing that I use in my uh, lab quote unquote lab. And the, the quantitative fit tester uses a condensation particle counter to measure the number of particles inside the mask. Uh, there's, it's just, there's kind of some science behind it. You use a singly charged 50 na 40 to 50 nanometer particle using an electrostatic classifier, yada, yada, a bunch of science nerdy talk. But what it fundamentally measures is the only way particles could get into the mask is by leaking around the mask. And so by directly measuring the number of particles outside the mask, and the number of particles inside the mask, it gives you a direct measurement of how well it performs. And I think to me, this is probably one of the most important and powerful mechanisms that we could have. And I hope that we can increase the supply of these devices over time. I'd love to see the government get involved um, because it lets us really understand the exact number of your fit. And so that's, that's what fit testing is. And, it, and it's available and also uh, locally. So if you Google search industrial hygiene, occupational medicine, those services are provided to hospitals. As a private citizen, you can call them and you can reserve an opportunity to go do either one of those tests there. So that's another option. It usually costs $150, but you can actually get fit test tests as an individual through those services as well. Aaron, I, I know I've heard a lot of people talk when, I, when I've mentioned the fit testing to family and friends, because we, we, it's the kind of thing we have to do if you work in a lab, for example. So I'm used to seeing those things in a work setting. But my family and friends might say, well, those kits are really expensive. And that can be a barrier to people getting uh, fit testers. So this, I know chat about different ways that people can uh, can share the resource so the community can come together and you can get together with family or friends buy a joint kit and share it in a library-like system so there are various ways i think people can organize together and share the costs and the resources etc yeah, oh go ahead 
Could you also uh, mention, you said there are DIY kits. How much do those cost? It would be good to know that, too. So you could buy a professional uh, fit tester. Uh, I'll, I'd have to go to 95 Project, what they're running. They, they did sell them for a while, the Gearson fit tester. Um, otherwise, there's people that are kind of, you know, it's, it's, again, it's not, it's not to the same level, but you can kind of make your own using these sort of uh, Amazon purchased nebulizers, or you can purchase them from other locations too. And th this can be a good, a good metric to, light, to allow an individual to try to assess that. Because one of the cool things about respirators that you can do is that if you have a leak, you can seal it because you have hands and fingers. <laughs> and so if you're like, I think my nose wire is leaking, you can use your finger to seal it up and then retest it. Um, and so there's kind of some of those kind of nice things about uh, being able to mechanically manipulate it on you that really gives you insight into that. Uh, and so those, those solutions, I, I can dig up on that in, uh, on Twitter and find the individual that I had been publishing some work on that and I can share that link. Uh, I'll tweet it out for people that are interested in that. Great, thanks. Um, I do have a question representing us glass wearers. Um, occasionally I've had my glasses fog up when I'm wearing a mask, but I have noticed when I'm wearing the Aura 3M, that's not happening. So um, can you talk a little bit about, about that? Yes, glass fogging is a notorious problem with uh, all of mask types. And early in the pandemic, um, there was kind of this, this I, I don't know what you would call, exactly how you call it, but maybe just sort of this like general rule of thumb that wasn't quite true, which is that was if, if your mask is fogging, it doesn't fit you. And the answer to that from a kind of a more scientific standpoint is eh, kind of true, but it depends. Uh, in fact, I have a nice little YouTube short that I made to cover this particular topic. So if you just Google Aaron Collins YouTube, you can find it. It's, it's one of my most recent videos. Um, and I tested the concept um, and I used a fitted mask to me. So I knew it was well fitted. I knew that it's slightly sealing my face. And even with that mask, it fogged my glasses. And the reason is that there's kind of two mechanisms at play. The first one, which we'll talk about, which is the one that most people associated with bad fit is that the mask is not sealing to your face well. And so the, the moment you start breathing out, your air is actually blowing up by your nose and onto your glasses because the mask isn't sealing to your face. And so at the end of your breath, the second you breathe out, if your glasses fog, that can be a sign that the mask is not sealing well to your face. However, there is a second mechanism. And that is something that I show in that video, which is my glasses fog. But the difference is that they fog towards the end of my breath. And that's because when you breathe out, you're breathing out warm, humid air. And so it's buoyant and it rises up. And depending on the mask design, if that mask is highly breathable, that warm, buoyant air comes out of the mask, rises up, and begins to get close to your glasses. And your glasses are slightly below the temperature of the temperature. They start to condense on there. And so my kind of rule, kind of rule of thumb is if your glasses are slowly fogging towards the end of your breath, probably not a mask fit problem. But if the second you start breathing out, you start immediately getting glasses fogging, that could be the sign. So glasses fogging necessarily doesn't, you know, if, if that's your metric, you gotta really have to think about is it the start of breath or the end of the breath? And really, if it's at the end of the breath, you may not, you most likely do not have a mask fit problem. Great, thank you. That is, that is very helpful. All right, another thing that uh, my friends and the folks have been talking about is exercise with a mask. Um, that can be tough. Um, do you have any recommendations regarding better masks to use for exercise? And also just how is like sweating and perspiration going to affect how my mask is holding up and working and protecting me? So I will, I'll be very frank. Exercise is certainly one of the more difficult challenge uh, in terms of like using a mask. Well, why is that? Because one, we have really high breathing rates, right? So we're having to push as much air through that mask as fast as we can, and we get sweaty, right? Like we rely on cooling down by wind blowing across us, whether we're running or whatever we're doing, right? That keeps us cool. And suddenly we're covering our face. You're going to get sweaty under there. So I think the first question that you had is, you know, does perspiration impact mass? And the answer is, you know, I haven't tested it personally, but there are some good journal articles. In fact, there's a recent publication about a year ago or an individual, uh, a team took N95s, measured the filtration efficiency of them. Then they'd soak them in artificial, artificial perspiration, let them soak, dried them, and then tested them again. All the masks that they tested all performed the same. In fact, one mask 
actually filtered better. <laughs> now, my, most likely when we look at that, you know, it was not statistically significant in terms of the variability, but still it highlights that there was not an observable difference between those two masks. And, and that matches the theory of electrostatic fiber, which is that they can get damp or wet. So if you're breathing and it's a cold day and they get a little condensation on it, it's not going to hurt it. If, as long as it's pure water. You cannot, of course, wash these masks with any surfactants or soaps, or and we really do want to avoid getting in them damp if we can. Uh, but yeah, no washing, anything like that. But if they get damp with, get wet with sweat, you can just let it dry out, and it still will be effective. Um, when we talk about uh, exercise, then for me, what I found is that it's all about breathability. So if you could think about trying to, you know, breathe through a straw or try to breathe through, you know, something a little bigger than that, or your mouth is normal, all of those things add restriction. And, and no one's going to be able to run a marathon breathing through a drinking straw, right? So we want a lot of surface area, we want a lot of mass, we want high good, good filter media, and they do exist. My personal favorite ultra breathable mask is the 3M 9105 E-Flex. One of the highest... Uh, breathability mask so it has the lowest breathing resistance great mask to do it and i i am convinced that you can run a marathon i have been doing some testing i'm a cyclist i like to be you know i love biking i do structured training i've been doing some tests to see could i go to my max power wearing an n95 a v-flex does it limit me the answer is yeah it does slightly at full power output but at 70 percent, 80 percent, i'm actually not limited by the mask my breathing rate in the mask is comfortable enough to maintain that so you know, exercise is really difficult. So my recommendation is always do it outside if you can. You've already built in a ton of safety by doing exercise outside. If you need to go to the gym, look at high breathability masks. So the 3M9105, I've also tested the Champak. You can get that on Project N95. It's a bifold N95, ultra breathable. And there are and duck bills like the Gerson, 30, uh, the Gerson duck bill, the Kimberly Clark duck bill. Basically masks that have high breathability are gonna help you a lot if you're trying to exercise. All right. Awesome. So some, some other questions I've been hearing about too, is um, just fitting children for masks, depending on their age. Um, can mask braces help? Um, and do we have any resources we can direct people to, to find qualified, well-fitting, high quality masks for kids? Yes, that, and, and I think kids still to this day are one of the hardest challenges in terms of mask fitting. One, we don't have a a international uh, or sorry, a domestic standard for kids. So in the U S our mass standard is an occupational standard, which makes sense because historically that's what it's been used for. But we have this new problem now that we need, we want people to wear good, high quality masks. We have the technology. We lack a standard in the U S so we're kind of reg relegated right now to using international standards. I am a big, big fan of the South Korean KF 94 standard. This is a standard that is regulated by the Korean FDA. And in my testing, I have yet to find a fake, and I've tested almost over 100 KF94s. As long as you can verify they're coming straight out of South Korea, the performance of these masks are really good, and they make a lot of different sizes, especially in the kid's size. So I'm a big fan of them. Uh, they do feature ear loops. There are, and I can talk a little bit about headband options, but they typically are ear loop. Uh, they feature that high-performance filter media that all the rest of the respirators do, except they're for kids. Uh, kids, of course, are challenging in terms of fitting, Mostly because not only do we have all the variability of face sizes and head size that we have as just different people, then you add on top of that different development cycles, even for the same age kid. You know, a one six-year-old might be, you know, 30 inches tall and one might be 60 inches tall. I mean, I feel like kids are all over the place in the development side. It's really hard to fit them. So that's a good place to start. Where can you get them? A project in 95 carries a lot of KF94s. You can also get them online from Korean buter importers. Like uh, that's, that's kind of what they were doing before the pandemic. And then they started importing KF94 masks. Those are available from companies like Collect USA and Be Healthy USA. Those are all great options. So I love KF94s. Just make sure they come out of South Korea. Um, mass fitters also are a great option too. You can get those. Uh, the, probably the one that I've used the most is Fix the Mask. It's an elastomeric sealing system. It's kind of very basic, but it's not, you know, it's nothing too high tech, but it works quite well. Those can be used to help seal any type of mask, a surgical mask or a respirator style. And they use this, you know, basically it's an elastomeric sealing system to push the mask against your face to provide a tight seal. Uh, and those you can get um, from Fix the Mask and they do make them in small kids. You know, when you get to really young kids, ah, there's still kind of a gap there. I wish we could close that. Um, for high risk kids, there also are some elastomeric options out there right now. The Flow Mask, they're out of California. Uh, make a kid's version, Elastomeric, that has a nice silicone seal and a, and a good quality filter on it, and it features headbands. So if you have a really high-risk kid, and you, that might be an option as well as the, is that. Um, and there are 
one or two <laughs> headband versions. I can't remember off the top of my head, but I have a YouTube video out there that covers all the basics of kids' masks. Also with that is a spreadsheet where I put all the data I have from all the kids' masks that I've tested up on there. So that is another good resource for parents um, to, to check out. Aaron, I just want to add that, yeah, there are, and you, we're seeing more and more options. I, uh, for example, just even the idea of getting a young kid, like a five-year-old, agreeing to wear a mask. <laughs> Project 95, sometimes they have those, um, there are, you know, little patterns on them, and I, anything like that <laughs> helps make it more fun. And um, I also want to share just an anecdote story. We, we use the KF94 that you mentioned with the combination of a mask brace and we got a five-year-old to pass a fit test which is and he's very high risk which is why we did it and so it can be done and i just it, it takes a lot of work to get kids to be happy with masks but if you make it fun for them and you try and find ones that they like um you can we've had a lot of success with several kids and my own niece does acrobatics wearing her in 95 that's great with it so i think that's incredible very amenable is that you work with them and make it fun for them yeah and i agree i think making it fun and, and comfortable masks right so i think looking at masks in terms of you know their performance and and stuff like that is very helpful in finding them a mask but really it's just try a few different types never just buy one i really recommend try to buy a wide range of options and let them try and let them decide um, I've had good luck with my son that way. He picked a mask that I didn't think he would like, but really was his favorite, and he wears it all the time now. So I think, you know, they're, they're, they can wear a mask, no problem. They're, they're probably better at it than some adults, to be honest. <laughs> totally agree with you on that one. And I, I think let them choose and be a part of the process is great advice. It's worked for us with several very, very young children who become real experts at wearing their masks. So it's wonderful. Aaron, oh, thank you. you. I if I can, uh, you, you mentioned the um, uh, elastomeric masks, and you really didn't cover this earlier. And, and given the need for high quality masks, could you talk a little bit more about them? And you know, how should people who are not familiar with elastomeric masks approach um, trying them out and, and thinking about what they should we should be looking at? Yeah, I, so I I I really think elastomerics are a great option when you're trying to maximize face fit. So when we talk about, you know, so what is an elastomeric mask? So these are, these are the masks that you might see a construction worker wear, uh, where they kind of have like a molded uh, rubber outside. They're not actually natural rubber. They're usually silicone, but they kind of have this like molded rubber. And then you see like these screw on cartridges that go on the side, although there are now a little bit more variety in that space. Uh, really what they're about is using a soft elastomeric material, in this case, typically silicone, to seal against your face because the silicone could form quite well to your face. They provide a wide sealing area. So what that means is that you don't get like pressure points. Remember all back to the to the time when we early in the pandemic, we would see the pictures of the nurse with the imprint of the, of the cup mask on their face where their, their skin is raw. And that's because those cup masks have a very small perimeter where they seal. And the elastomerics distribute that load much better, provide a better seal, so they're much more comfortable for long duration wear. And they also have the advantage that they provide a really good fit. Uh, and so you get really good protection. Um, the, the, and so if you're after a really good protection and if you're after like reusability, so like in healthcare settings, totally makes sense. Disposable N95s, if you're having to wear a mask all the time, probably doesn't make sense if you're wearing it for eight hours a day. Elastomerics are a good option. Um, they do have some trade-offs. One, they're a little bit more expensive to buy into. Um, so you're kind of committing to that. Uh, and right now with return policies, it's kind of hard to go, you know, <laughs> you can't really buy one, try it and return it. So you kind of have to like either try other people's, which they can be cleaned or, you know, you kind of got to bite the bullet and try some based on the size. Uh, and the other kind of couple of advantages that they have is uh, they have, they, they, they can impede communication a little bit. I am starting to see more elastomeric designs that have, uh, either transparent panel. There was a design uh, by a company, I'm blinking on the name right now, uh, that made a uh, hexagonal one with a clear panel, a canopy. Uh, that was a really cool looking design. Um, and others have included voice diaphragms or uh, speaking diaphragms. So they kind of resonate with your voice and helps keep the communication more clear because without them, the mask can damp a little bit of the communication. But if you're a high risk individual and getting COVID uh, could have very si severe consequences for you, there are something to consider. They're much more likely to give you a higher face fit factor than a traditional uh, disposable mask. So that's, those are some of the advantages. So, so maybe I, I know we're 
we're going to head for questions soon, but maybe you can uh, go uh, now and talk a little bit about uh, Pappers. Yeah, Pappers are super cool. So we kind of talked about that hierarchy, right? We kind of said, okay, you know, surgical and then kind of ear loop to mask, like KF94, K95s, and then it's headband loops in 95s, FFP2s, etc. Then we went to Elastomeric because they're going to provide our putter seal. And then at the top of the pile is Papper. And that is a powered air purifying respirator. What it means is that it uses a small, uh, basically a little backpack or hip pack that sucks air in, filters it at HEPA levels, and then passes that through a tube to a basically, like, think of it like a face shield that's positive air powered. So that means that you are constantly being delivered clean air regardless of how it's fitting your face because it's basically positive pressure. You're, there's no way for the leak to come in. The air is trying to always escape out. And so it gives you really the highest protection factor. To me, this is what we should be seeing in COVID wards anywhere, our PAPRs, because they really do provide some of the highest level. They do have some trade-offs. They have these little hip packs. They're not the lightest in the world. Um, and they can be a little bit noisy um, because you hear that kind of blowing air all the time. Um, and, and the other trade-off, and I used one, uh, well, I haven't used one, but I had some friends that have used one outdoors. Uh, it turns out outdoors because you're circulating all that cold air. Uh, it blows that cold air across your face. So there's some, there's some situations. But again, they are by far the highest level of protection that you can get. I think they're amazing devices. Um, but just, yeah, they, they do have a couple limitations to them. Great. I just want to give the audience a heads up. We're going to be moving to Q&A after this next topic. So if folks have questions, please go ahead and raise your hand and we'll get you queued up. So we're going to move to um, just beyond using masks for COVID protection. I know myself, I've been enjoying these past two years. I haven't had allergies. I haven't gotten the flu or a cold. I haven't gotten sick in so long, which has been excellent. And I know there's um, it's just an amazing health tool. So if we can just talk about um, sort of like how we're shifting the way we're thinking about using masks. I mean, I think all of the things you hit on are things that we didn't really think about before. And I think this, this to me is like this broader topic about uh, air quality, something we haven't really thought about. When we think about, you know, the history of time in the early 1900s, we had the introduction of the FDA, right? Dealing with adulterated foods. So when we were ingesting something, whether it's food, we regulated it with the FDA. When it's water, we had the Clean Water Act in the 1970s, right? We started to clean up all the things that go into our body when we ingest them. And one thing that we have ingested is air. And we kind of did, did outdoor air with the EPA in the, you know, the 80s and 90s. But indoor air and localized impacts aren't really captured right now. And, it's, and there's good reason. It's difficult to do to regulate that. And so I think we kind of lost sight that these masks and, uh, and, and protecting your, your lungs from a variety of other things are actually important. And so pollen is a perfect example, right? I am, I, I can't, I am very allergic to some grass pollen. It is the death of me sometimes. I mean, my eyes are watering. I am just really struggling. And you realize like, oh, I mean, I just a mask and I could probably cut almost all of that pollen to basically zero and not do it. And it took me a long time to even think about that even now, even though I'm the mask nerd, right? Um, and so there are these techniques to use mask spiders outside of just a COVID thing. Uh, pollen, of course, is one. Wildfire smoke is going to be, you know, it's continually becoming a problem in the U.S. and globally. Um, a lot of those particles are very, very small, and capturing them in N95 really, or, or any type of respirator, really protects your lungs so significantly, right? When we talk about, you know, air pollution warnings, people that are elderly that need to stay indoors, well, you can go outdoors. You just will need to wear a respirator. Um, I think one of my favorites that we don't really talk about a lot, but can happen and did happen in, I think, 1984, is Mount St. Helens, and, uh, the volcanic eruptions. Those can generate tons and tons of ash and dust that spread across the U.S., and it might happen in the future again. So, you know, N95s aren't just for, you know, respirators and masks aren't just for, you know, COVID. There's a huge spectrum. And so mowing your lawn, wildfire smoke, you know, that, um, all of those things are really, they're really powerful tools to protect you. Uh, even if you're just raking your leaves, you know, you're just raking your leaves in the fall, you can throw on a respirator and not breathe in all the mold spores. I usually, I, I got sick from, I live in Minnesota, we have lots of leaves. I would get regularly sick after raking the leaves. Now you think I'm an air, you know, aerosol guy, you think you'd understand this, but you know, it took me a while to realize like, oh, these things that I'm raking and shaking up, this is full of mold and I'm breathing them in. Maybe I should wear a respirator. And I do now, and I don't get sick after I rake the leaves. So it's kind of amazing how we, if we protect our lungs just like we do with every part of, other part of our ingestion mechanisms. Uh, we can really, you know, protect our bodies. 
Yeah, I absolutely share the experience with you. My grass mowing and gardening experience is far more pleasant with a mask now with all my allergies. <laughs> but uh, Yanir, it would be wonderful if you maybe could comment um, on how masks can also help with the other issue we're dealing with, monkeypox now. So could you comment on masks and monkeypox? Uh, well, I mean, the, the short statement is um, there is a, a long history of, of tracking the uh, mechanisms of spread of uh, both smallpox and monkeypox, uh, and, and, and less of monkeypox. But the evidence that we have for both of them is that there is airborne transmission. Um, and uh, surely this was the recommendation that was present that airborne transmission precautions should be observed for monkeypox um, has been the recommendations. In recent uh, uh, last few weeks, uh, unfortunately, um, our uh, health, uh, um, our, our standard health agencies have all of a sudden uh, decided to remove that from their websites uh, and from their statements. There is no uh, re reason that we, we should be ignoring the possibility of airborne uh, transmission. In fact, again, the historical evidence is that there is airborne transmission, uh, and surely from a precautionary point of view, uh, we should be doing what we can to prevent uh, being infected. Um, it, one of the th dangers that we have right now is that people are only uh, looking in the place where they expect to find cases so there's a limitation on testing that is focused on um, uh, men who have sex with men because that's been the predominant community for early transmission. But of course, now we're beginning to see transmission in children, to children. Children have been infected, uh, particularly in the last uh, couple of days in Europe. There have been reports. And, um, and uh, more generally, uh, uh, we really should expect that this will spread in the community and the best way, of course, to, to prevent it is to stop transmission. And uh, the way to do so is to take all of the precautions that are needed, including both um, what many people understand uh, as being important, which is contact, physical contact, um, droplet, uh, so objects that are contaminated, clothing and bedding uh, that are contaminated, but also surely uh, airborne transmission so masks should be worn uh, to prevent um, monkeypox transmission. All right, thanks. Uh, Greta Fox, if you'd like to go ahead with your question, we'll take your question first. Oh, thank you very much. Um, hi, Aaron. Um, I'm kind of one of the mask people at World Health Network. I follow you very closely and I appreciate all you do. Thank you so much. You're a terrific resource. Um, going back to fit testing, I was just wondering if you could speak to when fit testing should be done. Um, people sometimes ask, should it be every time you put the mask on or just every time you put on a new mask? Do you recommend it for elastomerics as well as um, respirators? Thank you. Uh, and, and no problem. I, I, I'm glad that I can be a resource. So I'm just I'm glad almost works paying off and helping people. That's always been my goal. Um, Very much. So, uh, so in terms of, you know, fit testing. So OSHA requires that, uh, and I think this is a good, you know, kind of rough starting point, which is OSHA requires that uh, workers, and so if you're a worker and you're wearing an N95 for your occupation, you must be fit tested once a year. And you need to be fit tested on the mask that you're going to wear. And that's just to make sure that the mask that you've selected, you're going to wear that for the year, and that's going to fit your face because you've done some checkout on it by using this uh, fit testing. So I recommend that for the general public as well, that pick a mask and, and fit it, and you know, either quantitative or qualitative or or just you can even you can even use a user seal check as a kind of a rough estimate, um, and a user seal check is if you're wearing like, it most really works on cup masks and and some like Aurora you can kind of do it. It's basically covering the mask with your hands so that you can't suck, so you can't uh, breathe so easily through the mask. It creates more restriction, and using your using it to feel if you feel any cool jets of air kind of leaking into the mask, and so that's a user seal check. And you do really want to get fitted and do user seal check on the mask that you're going to wear. Uh, most of the time. So it's gonna be like your primary mask. Um, and so, yeah, and then you should, do you need to do it all the time? You know, you probably just need to do it periodically. I think OSHA requires once per year. I think that seems reasonable. Most people's faces don't change significantly over a year. 
You don't need to do it every time you don the mask. You do, they do recommend that you do use a do a user seal check every time you don a mask, but you don't necessarily have to do a proper fit. So, and normally, like a, in a quantitative fit, you actually punch a hole in the mask. So <laughs> you can only do that one time with that mask, and then you have to throw it away. Um, should you be fitted on elastomerics? I think the answer is, as always, I think if you can, absolutely. I would say get fitted on any mask that you wear, a respirator at all, because it just really improves the probability that you're getting a good seal. Elastomerics are a little bit easier to fit because you can do it with some other technologies. Um, uh, you know, but uh, in general, I think the answer is fit whatever mask you're going to wear, regardless of the type, if you can. Uh, user seal check at the minimum. And elastomerics are really nice for user seal checks because uh, some have them integrated in now. They have a little button you press, like the newest 3M. has a button on the front. You press it. It plugs the filters. You breathe in. It does a negative pressure check. You can feel if it's leaking. Release the button. You know it's good. Um, and so a user seal check could probably would be like the bare minimum on elastomeric. And I, I would like to expand on that, Aaron, that absolutely on elastomerics, you should get fit testers if you can. I, I know personally, and from test, fit testing a lot of people, um, many people fail with a different shape elastomeric. So just like with an N95, you have to try and find one that fits your particular shape of your face, etc. Yes, yeah, very important. I think it's probably the most important thing right now when we talk about respirators. Yeah, I noticed that the flow mask um, adult um, actually has um, a high nose bridge and a low nose bridge um, version. So that seems like a, I haven't tried the flow mask myself. I'm an Envo mask person, but that does seem like an important feature. Yeah, yes, I think so as well. I mean, I think when we look at a la respirators in general, I think it really does is, is that you're going to probably have to try a diff few different styles to find one that fits your face because everyone's face is unique. Your, the height of your nose, you know, your nose bridge, uh, the width of your face, the height of your face, all of these things cumulatively go together to determine how well it fits. And even, you know, uh, the, the Invo mask might work great for some individuals and then some individuals because of that gel seal and quarter mask style where it just seals around the, the bottom of your chin, they can have leakage issues there too. So it, it really highlights that you probably are going to have to try a few different versions to find the one that fits you. These are all such great points. I just want to remind everyone that if you go to Aaron's bio, you'll find the YouTube link for all these videos on so many questions about masks. And if you have general questions about COVID-19 or monkeypox or masks uh, in general, we also have resources on our worldhealthnetwork.global website, which you can also find and navigate through our profile. So we will move next to Kristen Hunter for a question. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I was wondering for elastomeric masks, how often should the filter be replaced? Oh, Kristen, we're having a little bit of trouble hearing you. If you want to try again. Sorry, can you hear me now? We can hear you. Great. Um, I was wondering for elastomeric masks, how often should the filters be replaced? So in general, you got, of course, I'm always going to cop out and say, follow the manufacturer's guidelines. Uh, it depends on the style of filter that you use. I think with elastomeric, you see a lot of P100 use. And P100 use for most manufacturers, uh, including 3M, is that they recommend replacing them. I think, I think it's every six months or a year. You'll have to double check on the timeline. Or if it becomes hard to breathe in are the two kind of restrictions that they have on those. So they can, it can be used for a very long time. Um, other mask manufacturers like Dentec and uh, GBS, I am not sure on their N95 cartridges exactly how often. Uh, so I would check with the manufacturer, but typically it's going to be, you know, even with disposable masks, uh, 3M, uh, if you, if there's a good YouTube video that I just did where I interviewed them. Uh, they, they have come out and said for, you know, for general public use, you can use it until it's hard to breathe in. So, you know, recommend whatever the manufacturers are going to recommend, of course, has to be the, the cover your, cover your butt response. But uh, P100s is going to be the very long use. And if you use an elastomeric, you got lots of filter you can use. So P100s are actually still a great option in the elastomeric space. We have really good protection. They last forever and uh, nearly forever. Uh, and so that would be my recommendation. I'm sorry I don't have a more specific answer. I haven't done a lot of testing with elastomerics just because as we get more and more mass, it becomes a harder project for me to stay on top of. But that's, a, that's the best knowledge that I have right now. And Aaron, can you, just to follow up on that, can you share with us any experience you have on um, if I'm wearing my N95, how often can, can I wear it? How, how often should I uh, change it for a new one? 
So my recommendation has been, oh, so, th so the standard answer is, uh, of course, follow the manufacturer's recommendations. In the case of like 3M as an example, we'll use them again. They've said if it's hard to breathe in, which makes sense because it's gonna restrict the flow to the mask. Uh, and the other thing is that when we talk about face fit, right? Remember that face fit is the most fundamental aspect. So if the mask begins to lose shape, the headbands get loose and it's no longer sealing to your face, you're gonna wanna get rid of it. In my experience, what I found is about 40 hours is kind of the upper limit of where you can get to. The masks start to lose their shape, especially disposable, specifically disposable respirators. Um, they, they start to lose their shape. The nose wire starts to get a little mangled over time. The head straps start to loosen. But for me, the biggest driver is they get a little stanky, right? You kind of been breathing in, they're collecting stuff out of your mouth. They start to have a little smell to them. They get soiled. So from my experience, it's, I recommend usually like 40 hours. So one week of total wear time, and then you can toss it. Um, otherwise, the you know, always cover your butt. So it's going to be, you know, whatever the manufacturer recommendations are, if there's less than that. But my testing has shown, uh, even with KF94s and some N95s, that 40 hours is really no problem. And again, it's not surprising. When you look at the test method, they test these things way harder than you could ever wear one. That NIOSH spec requires 200 milligrams of aerosol loading. And how much is 200 milligrams of aerosol loading? That's like you on a bad air quality day in Shanghai wearing that mask 24 hours a day for about 170 days. So like the, the requirements of these masks are pretty crazy in terms of how well they need to perform. Aaron, I have a question about um, storing the mask in between uses. Um, I myself am guilty of this. Like I hang mine in my car and I see almost everybody doing that as well. Is that okay? Is there another way that we should do it? I've also heard about storing it in paper bags. Um, can you speak to that? Yeah, sure. So I think um, when we talk about storage of masks, there are some upper temperature limits that, that are out there for like 3M, for example, says that you shouldn't exceed 122 degrees Fahrenheit with the mask. Uh, so can a car get to 122 in Texas on a really hot day? I think you probably could get up there. Um, so it kind of depends. I mean, I think if I lived in Arizona or Texas, um, it may be something to think about maybe bringing it in. Um, but for me and my experience testing masks and my personal use, I leave them in my car. In fact, all the used mask testing that I did, I would wear it to work that day. It goes in the car overnight or, the, you know, the, and, and I cycled through on a few day basis. So those cars were, you know, masks were sitting in my car for, you know, five or six days before they get reworn. I live in Minnesota. It's not, you know, it gets pretty warm in the summer here and they still perform well. So in general, I don't really have any concern with leaving them in your car, assuming that it's not, you know, 122 degrees or higher in your vehicle all the time for long duration. Um, in terms of cycling masks, you know, there's some concern early in the pandemic about fomite transmission. So masks collecting, you know, COVID on them, and then you touch the mask and now it's on your hands. And, you know, based on the data that I'm seeing and, and, and others can speak to this, but, you know, I haven't really seen a compelling argument that, that fomite transmission is a dominant mechanism of aerosol spread or mechanism of COVID spread. So the risk is much lower. It, it's a nice, you know, extra bonus safety thing to let it rest for a few days. COVID does naturally die on itself if it's not on, you know, on a, just a plastic surface. It can only last for so long. So allowing a mask to just rest, well, the, COVID, the COVID virus will slowly die in that mask. And so that was kind of the idea to extend mask usage for healthcare workers was to rotate it. So if you want a little extra safety margin there, you can do the rotation method by putting it in a plastic bag or leaving it on your counter for a few days, two or three, four days before you wear the mask again. Great. Um, Tatiana, you had a question. So you can go ahead with yours. Yeah, thank you. First of all, thanks, Aaron, for, for making science so cool and so accessible. Um, and from one Minnesota alum to another, thank you especially. Um, so I am a very active person, and many ask me if I have trouble um, exercising with a mask on, um, and especially if there is too much CO2 accumulation in the mask um, and whether that can be damaging. And I would love to hear your thoughts about that. Yeah, so this is a, you know, it's actually a good, it's a good topic. I mean, I think the science is not, I mean, there's, there's definitely some very bad journal articles that got published recently with really wrong methodology. Uh, but there is some legitimate discussion about, you know, the small amount of trap volume in the mask. So when you think about a mask, there's a little gap between your face and the mask. And that will trap some amount of your exhaled breath. Um, and so what I've seen from the studies is that you can measure, measure an increase in CO2 uh, it, within, in your total like breathe uh, inhalation volume, you know, that, that increase in CO2. But there's been no real physiological association to things like, you know, your SpO2 or like your, your blood oxygen levels. Um, and so it's really, you know, and it's, it's something that's there, but it's really not a big issue. 
this is even further expounded upon by the fact that these masks have been used for, I mean, people have been wearing a 95 since they were invented in like the 1970s, right? These aren't a new product. People have been wearing these all day for work in construction sites and doing physical labor. That's why the, you know, in the NIOSH testing, they tested 85 liters per minute because that's about 80% of your max effort. Why? Because they knew people would be doing physical labor while wearing one of these masks. So there is not really a risk there. It doesn't restrict your breathing. Absolutely. You know, we've all been there. If you run as fast as you can, you will start to limit the, you know, you will exceed your anaerobic capacity of your lungs. You'll start to get lactic acid. You'll start to get lightheaded. We've all been there. And, and restricting your breathing with a mask does exacerbate that. But if you get an ultra breathable mask, and I've worn them myself during exercise, they can be very, very small impedent, imp impediment to your exercise. And the risk reward is there, right? So yes, you may have to slight, you know, you're not gonna be able to go run a 400 meter dash wearing an N95. Uh, and not expect to be somewhat limited by that. But the real reality is if you're in an indoor gym, reducing your probability of getting COVID or long COVID, and I know many athletes that have been affected by COVID where they cannot exercise for months. Um, and that's, you know, for some athletes, that's a huge, you know, eight, eight weeks is your entire season in cycling sometimes. Um, and so they're, they're, that risk reward to me is totally there. Like if you're an indoor in a gym, wearing a good ultra breathable mask can really get you there and provide protection for you, allow you to exercise and avoid the long-term impacts of COVID as well as the short-term impacts of, you know, severe illness. Thank you. Looks like we have um, Raritan up next, if you'd like to ask your question. Hi all. I was wondering about outdoor transmission, um, specifically if I'm wearing my mask outside on a walk or if I'm in a park and there are other people uh, with me at the park. Um, what, I guess, what would be the protocol? What is, what do I need to do to stay safe um, in those types of situations? Um. So, so Aaron is somehow muted. I don't know if accidentally, but the, the problem maybe I can articulate is that airflow outside can go in many different directions. Air can be static, air can be moving in different directions and can be very variable. And, and so the, the challenge of the situation when people are around you is ultimately, where is the airflow going? Is it bringing the air from them to you? Is it bringing the air from you to them? Is it uh, taking it at a, in a different direction? Uh, if the airflow were consistent and going in one particular direction, um, then uh, you could decide based upon the airflow whether or not you should wear a mask, but that's not the usual circumstance. So if you're um, in the vicinity of other people uh, wearing a mask is, is surely advisable, uh, given the uncertainty of, of where the air is going to be moving. Thank you, Yanir. All right, next we have Marcio. Marcio, if you'd like to go ahead with your question. Hello? Hi. Can you hear me? We can hear you just fine. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry for my English. I'm a Portuguese speaker, but I have a question. Uh, if I am in my office walking with lots of colleagues without using any masks, and there is no ventilation, no air purifiers have a filter, no windows opened, how safe I am wearing a respirator for eight hours in that closed office with no one wearing masks and the majority coughing all the time. Thank you. Go ahead, Aaron. If you'd like. Oh, I, okay. Yeah, I wasn't sure who, who wanted to tackle this one. So, I mean, I, you know, in terms of from an aerosol standpoint, you are the most protected that, in that space wearing a well-fitting respirator. So in, in the space of that, con in the context of that discussion, you know, it's annoying that we have lost universal mass standards, especially that the COVID pandemic is still going. But the thing that you're doing is the best that you can do. So by wearing a well-fitting respirator, you've reduced your risk as low as you practically can. Um, I would love to see some ventilation in that space uh, and stuff like that. Another metric that you might want to think about using 
is you can purchase uh, CO2 meters, and they might be a good way for you to gauge uh, how much actual natural ventilation or mechanical ventilation is that space. And if it is extremely high, then the answer is that you might have to think about, you know, either a fit test or thinking about going to an elastomeric or higher performing respirator to help reduce your risk in that type of scenario. If I can just add, I think I think it's quite clear that, you know, one person with a mask on, and surely the case that Aaron is pointing to that's not fit tested, um, it, it, it's not a good risk to take over time. Um, and, and, and the question of how much time is going to be sensitive to exactly how good a fit it is um, and um, the, the precise conditions in terms of uh, how much ventilation there is, uh, it's surely better... Uh, uh, if it's possible to have a HEPA purifier in the space. Um, and of course, it's even much better if you don't have to be in that space, if there's some way to uh, avoid being there altogether uh, in those uh, kinds of conditions. And again, as, as we said at the beginning, um, the, when two people wear masks, the risk goes far down compared to one person wearing a mask uh, or the other person wearing a mask. Um, and, and so that's clearly much better if we can get everyone or even multiple people to wear masks. So the, the, the hierarchy here is clear in terms of safety. Um, but the question then becomes what it is that, that you can do. And as Aaron said, it's surely better for you to be wearing your mask, even if other people are not wearing masks, than not to be. Uh, and, and, and then you have to ask what other things you can do. Uh, in order to better protect yourself. I would add one other thing too, is that when we look at the risk and that type of scenario, one of them you described is like walking down a hallway. And so depending on the structure and, and duration of time, that's another thing that's kind of going on your side. So spending, lim you know, shortening the amount of time of exposure to those situations can also help. So if it is a hallway, you know, and it's, or, or, you know, and you can just walk through it, your risk is much lower than that same scenario of everyone unmasking in a small room for eight hours, right? So sometimes it's good to also consider about the duration of the exposure as well, not just the, the total magnitude. So that, that can give, maybe give you some context about ways that you might be able to avoid the sort, sort of more risky situations when large amounts of people are unmasked in a poorly ventilated space. And, and if I can just build on this, what we're really starting to do is you've given us a constrained condition. You've said, this is the condition that I have in terms of masking. And immediately we're looking to other pillars of prevention, including ventilation, air filtration, HEPA filtration, uh, including uh, distancing, so less time or being not in the space. Um, and ultimately also to the extent that it's possible to test the people before they come into the space. You know, the, the, those are the four pillars, the testing, the ventilation and HEPA filtration, the masking, and, and the social distancing. So um, there's also, of course, vaccination, though today vaccination is not effective at preventing transmission, though it may help with reducing severe disease. So those five together are the primary tools that we have, the pillars that we have for preventing transmission. Um, and and, and uh, it's, it's worth keeping that in mind whenever you are, are thinking about the safety of a particular circumstance. Thank you, Yunair. And I think that we have those pillars up on our feed. People can look for those soon. If they're not up already, we'll be posting them soon. Thank you. So Ashley, um, would you like to ask your question next? Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, that's great, because uh, I'm in Australia and I don't have great reception, so I apologize in advance if I cut out. Uh, I'm a veterinarian down here, and uh, one thing uh, we've encountered is we've been close contacts uh, in a few different scenarios. So at home with vulnerable people, we've worn masks inside until the risk passes. My question is, can wearing a mask while infectious increase the viral load to the wearer? It may be a more viral question, but um, yeah, I thought I'd ask. So I, I'm happy to take that. I don't know if Aaron, you have some thoughts, but basically the, 
the, the physics is pretty clear, right? If you're breathing out viral particles and you breathe them back in, you can cause the virus to the viral load to increase relative to breathing it out and it not coming back into your lung. Um, so uh, I don't know of any specific experiment that has been used to study this, but we know that early on in the uh, infection um, and, and for many uh, throughout the infection, the infection is only present in a few locations in the lung. Um, and so if you're going to breathe it out and breathe it back in, it has an opportunity to get to other places in the lung than it was before. Um, and so indeed, one would prefer not to wear a mask while infected. Under those circumstances, one would, should, of course, have effective ventilation, HEPA filtration outside. So having a HEPA filt purifier near your, you or having windows that go to areas where other people are not going to be um, would be the preferred way to reduce the risk of, of, uh, of viral load, of increasing viral load in the lungs. Now, I don't know if, if, if Aaron has some thoughts, but that's what I uh, would have for that question. Yeah, I mean, I, I think from my perspective, when we talk about and, 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 and lung mechanisms in terms of inhalation are well understood. These have been well characterized by scientists looking at uh, a variety of things, cigarette smoke and inhal inhalable medicine. Um, and so those are quite common views. So yeah, if you had an infection in your nose, and sorry, there's an airplane heading overhead. I'm, I'm outside enjoying a beautiful Minnesota afternoon. Uh, but if you have uh, a viral infection in your nose and you inhale, those particles will shed and will travel to your lungs whether you're wearing a mask or not. And conversely, when you exhale, those particles are generated in your lungs. They travel up through your bronchial passages, up through your nose, and will collect there. And then they come out your mouth, and that's how we infect other people. And a mask really doesn't have a huge impact on that transmission mechanism within your lung. That's how we spread COVID to other people, is because the mechanisms of particle generation happen inside your lungs. And that mechanism also causes them to go through all of your respiratory airways on the way out, out of your mouth, into the air, and then unfortunately into other people's lungs. And so masking while infectious, I think is a very important thing. Although you're correctly, you know, using ventilation and not having to wear a mask is definitely preferable. People are gonna be more comfortable and it's just much easier to recover in that situation. But if you're around someone that is, you should definitely think about wearing a mask as a mechanism to stop the spread of COVID. Um, so I hope I provide some additional context about uh, inhalation and particle generation in the lungs. Yeah, just to reiterate, if you're infected and you're near someone who's not infected, you definitely want to be wearing a, a mask. Uh, but if you can find other ways to protect yourself or to protect them by not having them being in the room and by having a, a adequate HEPA filtration, uh, then it's, it's better not to have to wear the mask. All right. Thank you. We're going to have time for a couple more questions. Uh, Grace, uh, go ahead. Thank you for taking my question. Um, I had a question about um, uh, breathable mask. Um, does the protection go down um, with a breathable mask? I've been wearing like KN95s. Uh, I get them through Project N95. And I've noticed that like the 2006 standard, they switched over to the 2019. And I, I'm finding the 2019 to be a little thinner. Um, of course, uh, Project N95 is vetted, but I was just wondering, like, if if the quality goes down as far as protection, if it's if it's uh, more breathable. Uh, thank you. Yeah, that's a that's a really good question. So I think a lot of people look at respirators uh, like KN95s or even N95s, and they kind of make a judgment about how well the mask works solely by the thickness of the mask material or how breathable it is. And that's the beauty of a regulated mask standard, is that the performance of that mask is directly correlated to the standard that it's tested against. And it does not have any correlation to the thickness of the mask or the breathability. In fact, my testing, and yeah, you can, you're going to unfortunately hear some airplanes fly over. My apologies, I'm outside. <laughs> um, I'll, mo I'll move inside if they're going to keep being annoying like this. Uh, but the, the performance of that mask in terms of breathability is uh, is actually something that we strive for. So the most breathable mass, the breathable mass that I've tested, like the 3M9105, right? That actually per, still provided 99% filtration efficiency. And this is why standards are so important, that you can have a breathable mask and high filtration, as long as you know that it's legit. And so by going to Project N95, you know it's legit. 
And then searching for a breathable mask, you know, there's no compromise to that. You're getting that protection and you're getting the comfort that goes along with it. So you can wear it for a longer duration. So I think uh, I would have no concern at all if you know it's a legit mask about its breathability or it's the thickness of it. In fact, most masks that are really breathable, I'm seeing them getting thinner and thinner. And that's because the less material you have, the less restriction. They can still give the filtration, but the, fewer, the least amount of material you use to do that is going to provide you a more breathable interface. So hopefully that answers your question. All right. Thank you. Um, Bharad, I've seen you uh, request a couple of times. I hope you're available to ask your question. Uh, yes, I, so I, yeah, I do. Uh, thank you for um, you know having this session. This is really knowledgeable. I have a question for Aaron. Aaron, we talked about protecting the nose and the mouth. Do we need to protect the eyes? or the risk about uh, the virus entering to the eyes is, is not important at all. And the second question that I have is, when do we ha going to you know, uh, have masks as something that we're going to use year on year? I know the pandemic is raging right now, even though some countries have said that there's no pandemic, we're going to more endemic stage. Why didn't the doctors uh, prescribe the, uh, the, these masks to avoid various respiratory virus like flu? Once they saw in 2020 and 2021, these masks really made a change apart from the flu vaccines. So those are my two questions. So the, the eyes was a tough one. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll answer from the, the information that I have, uh, and then you can hear could jump in if he has any additional there. So when we talk about purely from an aerosol standpoint, when I say aerosol, I mean particles that are floating in the air that are less than 100 micron. Those, in terms of you know deposition in your eyes or like accumulation in your eyes, is going to happen much, much, much less frequently than your lungs. So for example, your alveoli area in your lungs is roughly the size of a tennis court, whereas your eye area represents, I don't know, maybe a couple quarters, right? <laughs> so the, the ratio is much different. And so there's not a lot of surface area for them to deposit from an aerosol standpoint. Droplets from people that are unmasked near to you, so you're sitting lower than them and their projectile coming out, I think that is still a risk. So if you're like sitting at a restaurant table and someone's standing above you and talking to you and they could be spitting into your eye effectively, I think that is still a relative vector of transmission. Um, in terms of aerosol, I, I, I am unsure. There is a recent journal article that was just a pub, un, published like a few weeks ago looking at uh, eyeglass wearers versus contact wearers and that they saw a slight statistically difference between con glasses wearers having a, a slightly lower incident of COVID versus non-glass wearers. But there's a lot of confounding things there especially when we tie back to you know, the eyeglasses fogging thing, right? If you wear eyeglasses, you inhale, inherently are a little bit more sensitive to fit of your mask. And so there's, it's a tough one to answer right now. I don't have a great question. I can only tell you my personal uh, risk level that I do. I don't really worry about goggles in the sense of, in it, you know, and stuff like that in terms of aerosol exposure. I would be a little more cautious about droplet exposure if someone's going to be spitting into my eye because they're unmasked. But in general, I don't worry about it too much. Uh, you know, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, I, I would say that, you know, I, I think the comparison that you're making is really the question. You know, you're asking, is airborne transmission more risky with your, you know, breathing in versus, you know, eyes? Um, and, and the answer is sure, of course. Uh, if you had a question of not to wear uh, goggles versus not to wear a mask, uh, you know, wear the mask uh, uh, and don't wear the goggles. But I don't think that's really the comparison that we should be using. I think the assumption that uh, one should wear a mask is clear. But let's say you're wearing a mask. Is the risk that remains significant, given that, you know, as Aaron said, we're knocking down the probability of being infected uh, by aerosols by a lot by wearing the mask, the, the point is that the residual risk becomes the risk that you're taking. Uh, and so we do have more than one studies that have shown that um, transmission through deposition into the eyes. And, and I don't know that there is this uh, sharp distinction between the, um, the droplet and the airborne particles. Uh, there is a, a, a continuum of sizes and there are different air conditions uh, that would give rise to the possibility of deposition into the eyes. So, so my uh, perspective would be, sure, definitely wear the mask. And, and, and then um, the question about whether to wear goggles uh, should be its own question in terms of reducing risk. And over time, these risks accumulate. Uh, and so I would definitely 
uh, recommend that people wear goggles under circumstances where they're at risk uh, for having, you know, contact. And we've heard various different conditions, right? Being in a room with many people, uh, being uh, outdoors um, and worrying about air flows. Uh, and all of those things are, are, are things that one could consider uh, and what are the levels of risk in different circumstances. But the point is, that, and, and Aaron has pointed to this, there aren't actually that many studies. And part of the challenge is that when indeed there is a dominant form of transmission and people are not exercising precautions, then you know, people are getting infected left and right. And knowing you know, why they got infected or how they got infected is very difficult. It's only when you block the dominant form of transmission, do you, are you able to see what the secondary and tertiary, the second uh, highest risk and the third highest risk of transmission is. Uh, and unfortunately, because of the current circumstances, it's very hard to know what that is. So from a precautionary point of view, one would recommend that people take uh, the extra precautions so that they don't get infected because you don't want to be in a situation where you know, you've done uh, a lot of work to protect yourself and then uh, you get infected. Now, of course, um, it's much better to be less frequently infected than more frequently infected as we see people are getting reinfected and reinfected uh, who are not taking precautions. But nowadays, uh, the risk levels are very high because of the fact that people are not taking basic precautions. Thank you. I just wanted to let folks know that we're closing uh, the more question requests, but those have been elevated. We'll get a turn. So we'll move to Nora and then Lorreen, Vera and Lorenzo, and we'll finish there. So go ahead, Nora. Hi, thank you. And thank you all for your advocacy. Um, so I'm a teacher. And one of the things I've been thinking about is what about having schools that are mask like like having a sort of a variety so parents can choose like a school where they have masks and a school where they don't, you know, they would have that option in a larger district, especially. And then, I mean, they got rid of the high risk mask hours. So bringing that kind of thing back as a mandate, maybe pushing for mandates like that, where, you know, instead of a universal mask mandate, which of course I would want, but instead of that, um, pushing for something like, okay, so every, the first two opening hours of, you know, places that are essential, so a, a drugstore, a grocery store, pushing for that kind of a mandate. What do you think about that? And would you push it with the stores themselves or with the local governments or both? Thank you. That's a tough one. So, <laughs> I mean, I think, I think, of course, if, if, if parents could organize a school that was masked uh, versus unmasked, I think that would be a nice, interesting idea, a way of tackling the sort of issues associated with masking. Um, I think, you know, and especially when we talk about grocery stores and having access to them, I mean, I think um, in the spectrum of risk, grocery stores and spaces that are not heavily populated uh, are a lot less risk because your duration there is lower. Um, I think in those kind of scenarios, I actually worry a lot about the workers um, because they may not have the option to not go to work that day. Um, and so they get kind of stuck. So I think it, it becomes a very complex issue about how we tackle masking uh, in this phase of the pandemic. And uh, it's, it's very difficult. I think to me, what, what I want to see more of is, is the broader discussion about other mechanisms to do it. Masks are one solution. I want to see a lot more discussion about ventilation because ventilation, whether you're masked or unmasked in school is beneficial for all of the students, um, not just for COVID. There's a lot of studies that are showing that exposure to ultrafine aerosols and, and, and a lot of PM25 in schools uh, is detrimental to the health of children. And so ventilation, um, things like 222 nanometer UV and some of the space that's coming out of there is very exciting to see. I think the broader concept of controls is probably something that I would like to see at the forefront first and then start to talk about, okay, masking as a sort of thing. And, and that's filing the engineering controls hierarchies where we look to change the environment first and then use a PPE as a, as a last mechanism. So, um, I think that you're, I think the idea of a school one of having split schools is really actually probably would have been a much easier solution to deal with the masking issues that are happening, but it still, it still sucks for the kids, the parents that choose to not mask and then they still get exposed. So it, it creates a really interesting dynamic from a, from a societal and sort of ethical question. I don't know, you near what, what are your thoughts on that? 
I think the main, you know, question is addressing the challenge in the local context, right? And the most important thing is to have people, you know, the, the ability to protect oneself is not an individual action. Um, uh, we've talked about a lot about the fact that masks are something that one can choose oneself. We know that there's also a lot of social pressure that goes along uh, today with people's choices, um, which is a, a very big impediment to individual ability to protect themselves. And that's a super important thing that we need to um, address. But in addition, um, uh, as we said, multiple people wearing masks, and as you understand it, is much better. Um, and the ventilation issue is also something that requires some form of collective action, right? So, uh, you know, it is possible in some circumstance for a child to bring a, a, a battery powered HEPA purifier and bring it in and put them in on, on their desk at school. Um, and even to aim it at their face, there are such uh, uh, battery operated traveling HEPA purifiers. Uh, and if that is something that's possible for a child to do, that would be something that would surely be important in terms of reducing their individual risk. Um, but more generally, um, the challenge is to have, um, to bring uh, HEPA purifiers into the classroom, uh, to have a, a, a space or, or spaces where children can be safer by uh, uh, all wearing masks. Um, all of these things are the question of what can be done locally um, and taking the initiative and, and, and understanding that the, ch the circumstances that we have now are challenging from this perspective, primarily because we do not have public collective action. And, and the reason that we don't have public collective action is actually that the system is very disempowering of people, um, despite, uh, you know, how we like to think about the society, uh, voting is not a good way uh, to, to have um, uh, people be empowered. Um, and so my uh, uh, agenda and my uh, priority is to find ways that people can act together in terms of improving their own safety uh, and progressively uh, in, uh, act to make that possible. We know, by the way, from many polls that most people would like to have better precautions in place. Uh, we know that this is being undermined. Um, and, and so our objective is to, is to strengthen the, the ability of people to act together to make things safer. Great, thanks. Um, Vera, would you like to go ahead with your question? Yeah, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yep, we can hear you. Okay, thanks. I apologize. I don't have a microphone and I'm outside. So uh, first of all, thank you for hosting. And I really, I've followed both of today's speakers for a long time and benefited personally uh, from your education. So thank you so much to both of you for the work that you've done uh, in terms of your own work and then getting it out to the public. Um, actually, in this room, I see... <laughs> like a, a sea of evidence-based policy advocates from lots of different backgrounds, um, all of whom I, I appreciate so much. I want to say thanks also for mentioning specifically elastomeric respirators and wildfires. Um, I live in BC, Canada. That's an issue. It's something that I, I would like to see our government and public health officials educate the public on is air quality for, for both um, disease prevention and wildfire hazard reduction as well. Um, so thanks for mentioning that. Um, I, I was going to ask about what you wanted to see, both of you, in terms of mandates, sustainable, healthy um, indoor air. And that's just been covered. So I, I'm just going to uh, go from what you were just speaking about. Um, you were saying that we do not have collective uh, public collective action because the systems do not empower us to find ways um, you know they do not empower us to challenge the the lack of mandates um, and that you're focused on ways that people can work to act together and I would also suggest that part of the issue that around not having the um, 
the public demand to have the political will to put in place mandates that protect everyone that are rooted in the very good data that we have from around the world about the fact that, you know, COVID is airborne and that high efficacy masking and engineering controls can reduce the risk for everyone. I think part of the issue fundamentally is a lack of public understanding and awareness, um, a lack of education about transmission and risks um, that we've all been witnessing for the last couple of years. So I guess I would ask, how can we, how can experts and the informed public and media and manufacturers, how can we all work together to, I guess, better educate the public about mask efficacy, um, you know, urgently, which I know lots of us have been trying to do the whole time. Thanks. So I, let, let me just say, uh, I think we should, I think you expressed your appreciation at the beginning, and I think we should really express appreciation for Aaron for what he's been doing to make people aware of of masks and how they can be selected and you know, warning people away from masks that don't work, but particularly demonstrating for people why and how they do work. So I think that that's super important as part of what you're talking about. Um, I, I think more generally that the challenge that you're asking is the challenge of the time. And it's not the scientific understanding. It's a, it's a visceral understanding of, of what is going on. People, um, for, for, for reasons that one can understand, are not aware of the air around them. You know, so they, they do see smoke, they do breathe in smoke, and they're aware of it in that context. But when air is under normal circumstances, people just don't think that the air can harm them when they don't see it causing harm or, or we don't smell it as causing harm. And, and so this is a big challenge. Um, the visibility of the problem uh, is a critical part. The other challenge that we're facing is a socio-political challenge, which is that we are, we have to, for very fundamental reasons, uh, trust uh, in the things that we consume. So Aaron talked about, you know, safe water and safe food at the beginning. But um, uh, the point is that today we don't question it, safe water and safe food in general. And the reason is because we've worked for many years to have authorities that are embodying the safety of the public. So when there is a breakdown in, um, in governmental authorities or in uh, other authorities in protecting people from harm, it's hard for people to realize that that's not working, right? The fact that the risks are high and the government is not taking action uh, is, is mind-bending in terms of its implications. And creating the realization that people have to take back responsibility for their own safety is difficult. You know, it's, it, it, it's not just food and water. It's, you know, our houses safe, our electrical system safe, are all of the things around us that we take for granted safe? Uh, and the answer is a lot of those protections have been undermined in various ways uh, in recent decades. And we need to rethink this issue of safety. And it has to start from people recognizing that the system is not actually working to protect people in many ways and, and taking back the responsibility and making sure that we have systems that actually do protect us. Excellent points. Excellent. Yes, we are taking it for granted for sure. Um, well, not maybe us on the call so much, but as a community in general. So let's move to our last two questions. Um, Lorraine, go ahead. Hi. Um, can you guys hear me? We can hear you great. Okay. Sounds weird because I can't hear myself. <laughs> okay. Um, I've never actually talked on a Twitter space. I listen in on sometimes. Um, I had a technical question um, about masks. Uh, I live in New York City. Nobody's wearing masks. I mean, mm, it's like most people are not wearing masks. And I've gotten very tired of telling people so, and I don't really want them to be talking to me when they're not wearing a mask. So I just 
you know, I'm very careful. Um, I've seen, I don't know if you guys have seen that one way masking chart where if you're wearing a high filtration mask, um, you have about two and a half hours in an enclosed room is the amount of time that they tell you that you should be able to wear the mask. And um, before, because of this latest reproduction number, and I think B, BA5 is actually slightly worse than BA2.12. So my question is, is if you're wearing a high filtration mask and say like you're in a work situation, like in an enclosed office for like eight hours, can you switch? And I know that the um, high filtration masks, uh, for example, the N95s, um, they work with static electrostatic electricity. And I think it's the relative humidity from breathing kind of lessens the electrostatic this. So I have a theory, and I wanted to run it by some experts because I really don't know who to ask, and I certainly can't find on the internet. If you were to bring, say, like four masks with you and to switch them out every two and a half hours, would you be able to stay in that type of environment and still be safe? And do you know, understand anything about where their thinking is with the one-way masking? So, so that is a really great question. And I think, um, it, and it's great because I, this is a little bit of a misunderstanding that I'm seeing everywhere. So I'm really glad that you asked this one. Um, so the first is that that chart that you're talking about, that was kind of an example of showing like the, the, the amount of time that you could wear an N95 before you would hit some like theoretical infectious dose level, right? Right. Th that chart is purely an illustrative chart, um, really trying to highlight the differences in terms of protection that you get from a variety of different mask types. However, the base of that chart, which is saying 15 minutes, was purely made up. And that, that, that someone just picked a number because that's what the CDC recommendation was. Um, and then they're relatively showing the difference of that. It turns out that the, um, the amount of time you can wear a mask is not predicated by that chart. The N95 that you're wearing will work all day for surely that eight hours. And the humidity that you breathe out doesn't affect the electrostatic filtration. In fact, the mass and NIOSH 95 is actually tested at high elevated temperature and humidity for 24 hours before it is tested. And it still needs to meet that 95% filtration efficiency at 85 liters per minute. So the mask will still work. You can just wear one mask. You don't need to switch them every 1.25 hours. What that chart was trying to show you, to show people as a numerical example, is how effective one-way masking is and two-way masking. Because when you look at the two-way masking, you know, you go from 1.25 hours to like eight hours if both people were wearing it. And it was really just trying to highlight that difference. It wasn't supposed to be a sort of uh, timeline that you need to follow. So one mask for the eight hours, you don't need to switch them unless you want to. You are more than welcome to. There's just no direct need to do it from a protection standpoint. Then and, why are people who are flying on airplanes one-way masking over like a five-hour flight? I'm assuming that, let's just assume that they never took it off. Why are they getting sick? And also the time on the masks have changed because it used to be with um, Delta or the wild type, it was much longer you could wear the N95 for supposedly. But supposedly because of the reproduction number, they've shortened it to two and a half hours. I, I think so if, I, about, a, if I, ahead, hit, I, I, I think that there is a critical difference that Aaron, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, is thinking about a well-fitted mask. And um, it's not true that people in general are wearing well-fitted masks. But even there, the, the level of risk is, is something that one has to consider how it accumulates over people and over time. So when you say that people are getting infected, some people are getting infected, some people are not getting infected. So you can't conclude from one person, because this is like rolling a dice, right? How uh, likely is it for someone to get infected? And so every time you take a risk, you're rolling a dice, uh, and that risk accumulates over time and over people. So that's why it actually is not about switching the mask because every time you have an hour or half an hour or 10 minutes, there's a certain risk of you getting infected. And then you're rolling the dice again, the next 10 minutes, the next 10 minutes, the next 10 minutes. Um, the probability accumulates over time, 
but it also again accumulates over people. So if you have 10 people in a space and each one of them rolls a dice, then some of them will get infected and some of them won't. And, and it's not just related to the amount of time uh, and the fact that they are wearing a mask. Is it clear what I'm saying? No, um, not really, because the, what I'm thinking of, I'm sure you've seen these mask charts around. Yep. Um, these are, I'm, I'm assuming it's based off of a well-fitted N95. And it seemed that, um, like we're talking about way back when, it was a row of two, reproduction of two. And now we're at like 15 or whatever, which is much, you know, you need a lower amount of infectious dose to get infected. So I, I assume that these mass charts have some sort of validity to them because so, why are they changing from all of a sudden you can wear it for 15, you know, you're safe for 15 hours one-way masking and then all of a sudden now it's only two and a half. So That's actually all. the charts that I've seen recently at least have mm -hmm. multiple uh, lines in them for at least qualitatively different variants, right? Because Delta has a much higher right. uh, viral load and Omicron is even faster. So, so mm -hmm. they have indicated that the time uh, of safety is reduced depending mm -hmm. upon the variants. So you can find one of these newer charts and see it. But I, I, I'm going to agree with Aaron in saying that these charts are based upon uh, a CDC number that was basically pulled out of a hat. It was really not a, a solid number. Um, and, and, and so, yes, there is a typical time, if you will, of, mm -hmm. of safety. But again, it, it's, it is going to vary with variant. And in fact, it's definitely getting shorter and shorter with different variants by definition because they're transmitting more rapidly. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but at the same time, uh, it does really depend upon um, the, the, how well fitted the mask is. And, and again, I mean, uh, uh, there, there, the, the time matters, the fit matters, um, and also the, the, you know, the ventilation uh, that is taking place in the space matters. Um, and all of these things are, are not right. It's really hard to tell whether someone is infected during the time of the flight or during the onboarding time when it was higher risk, or during the sitting in the in the airport, or the other activities they did around the travel, um, it's it's not the focal time is not necessarily the the time that they were sitting in their chair in the plane uh, on en route. So that's not necessarily the right time measure because there are many other things that happen during travel that can be higher risk than that time. Well, okay. thank you, Yanir, and thank, thank you, you. for this great conversation. We have one more question, and then we're going to wrap up. Um, so go ahead, Lorenzo. Yes, hi. Uh, thanks for everyone's time here and input. Uh, I just had a quick question. Um, I'm chronically ill, and I, um, I've been masking since, you know, before COVID and, and everything. I'm kind of a masking hipster, if you will. Um, I was wondering, um, currently I, I use and have always used, as a matter of fact, the Vogue mask and or the Cambridge mask, uh, you know, the reusable, um, they call them N95 comparable. But anyway, I'm not asking for, you know, because I'm not asking for a mask review or any anything specific like that. But I was just wondering, do, do you um, think that I should switch to a just a, a regular old N95, you know, a 3M Aura or whatever, you know, something from the N95 project or uh, basically what's my best bet, going that route or sticking with the Cambridge mask, you know, and, and double masking. Uh, that's that's a bit about all I have. <laughs> that's it. So, that's, a, that's a great question. And I could give you a review. Because I've tested them. Oh, I, oh <laughs> I, I love it. Okay, perfect. Yes. Okay, so, hit me. <laughs> so, 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 uh -huh. so the the high level of the last, you know, you kind of had a couple questions in there. Yeah. So we'll tackle the first one: fog mask, Cambridge mask. Oh, These okay. are masks that are using, you know, quote unquote, nano nanofiber filter material, and they're washable, etc. Mm. The basic gist is they do not perform as well as electrostatic melt blown material that's in your kind of standard N95. Um, they kind of were advertised that they could be washable. Uh, if you look at Vogmas washing uh, procedure, it has changed drastically over the last two years. First, it was you could wash soap and water, do whatever you want. Then it was like, okay, you can soap and water, but one drop of soap. And now their latest cleaning request is don't use any soap, just rinse it in water. And the reason, <laughs> and the reason is because 
you can't. <laughs> because uh, right. happened, when you wash it with soap, you introduce surfactants. And these nanofiber materials, we kind of rely on these kind of wide dispersed range of these fibers. And when you wash it with soap, they clump together and they're not as effective. So washing with soap de degrades the filter material. So, so Vogmas now says, don't use soap. Mm. Um, and so to me, the value statement of a mask that you can only rinse under hot water kind of becomes trivial when you can just buy an N95 that's going to perform better and be more breathable. Um, and so that would be my recommendation is, you know, the VOG mask is fine in some conditions, depending on your risk. It sounds like to me, you know, you're kind of like really driving for optimal protection. So a dispo, you know, an N95, an elastomeric respirator, you know, something that's really designed to seal and designed to do that task is, was what I would recommend in that scenario. Um, you kind of had mentioned, well, maybe I could double mask with it. And in general, you know, double masking, I've kind of shown to not really be that effective. Um, and this, of course, there's kind of two different styles of dove masking. There's the CDC, you know, last February, which is cloth uh, surgical mask and then a cloth mask over it or a, or like the VOG mask in this case. And well, you can get better protection that way. It comes at a big penalty of breathability. And so the mask is really not that comfortable. Uh, mm -hmm. And given the alternatives out there right now, if you had to say, Aaron, would you wear a Cambridge mask and a surgical mask or would you wear a V-Flex, which is like three times more breathable? I would say, ah, oh, wear the V-Flex. It's way more breathable. It's not the right. most pretty mask, you know, but, <laughs> yeah. uh, but there are other, you know, the Aura series, or there are other more attractive masks. BNX now makes uh, a black trifold uh, NIOSH N95. So there are some okay. much more options. So if you're kind of looking for the fashionable side, I think there are some better options out there. Um, you know, even if you're staying within an ear loop, because the VOG masks are ear loop, I still think that a KF94, or K95 ear loop mask is still better than the VOG mask. So that's kind of hopefully giving you a clue about where I kind of feel like those masks kind of lie in terms of their effectiveness. Um, if you never washed it, it's probably okay, but then it kind of defeats the point of it. So does that answer all of your question? That absolutely does. I, I sure appreciate it. Um, and I, I should have known that you had reviewed them, of course. Um, uh, I, okay. I, <laughs> I actually never uh, never wash them and I replace them every three months, you know, but but yeah, I can, I can toss fashion uh, to the wind, you know, in exchange for better protection. So that's really, really good to know. And there, and there are fashionable, you know, you're now starting to a lot of see a lot of printed K95s and K94s. I, I prefer sure. KF94s or something that's vetted. You uh -huh. are starting to see so you can kind of combine the both together. Um, yeah. I'm just really hoping that we start to see headband varieties of that. That's what mm. I think will hit really like the pinnacle where you can get, you know, the full spectrum of available protection but also be cool and fashionable at the same time. Yes. Uh, I'm really waiting for that to happen. I hope it happens soon. Uh -huh. uh, but if you're even at the ear loop level, I think there's sure. better masks out there. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Well, then that, that answers it. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. And I'll tell my family the same because I've been right. buying them <laughs> Cambridges as <laughs> long as I can remember. So we'll switch it up. Um, thank hey. you so much, Aaron. No I sure appreciate it. And everybody, right. thanks. Thanks. Uh, thanks you guys for facilitating this great, great talk. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks everyone so much for your questions and for your participation. We really appreciate your time and thank you so much, Aaron, for visiting with us tonight and Geraldine and Yanir. This was an awesome educational conversation. If you missed any part of it, you can catch the replay. Um, and we'll also be posting some um, pillars that Yanir talked about soon. So you can get some tutorials on that. If you're interested in joining the World Health Network community, please visit our website at worldhealthnetwork.global and navigate to the contact form. If you'd like to be a guest on one of our Twitter spaces, you can contact us there or just DM us here on our Twitter account. And Aaron Collins has an excellent YouTube account with so much, so much information about masks and that YouTube account link will be found in his profile. And our website is also found in our profile. So we also have um, meetings every day in a very active volunteer community. So I really hope that folks um, connect with us. We would love to network. We had some great conversations today and we'd love to speak with you again soon. So thanks everyone for a great night. Talk to you soon. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. <laughs>